I want to thank you all for being here. It's, it's just wonderful to see you all. It's just made my day. And I want to also say hello to some people who can't make it. And so I'm just going to give their names, their friends and family. First, I'll say Phil and Paul Solomon, who are in Boston. Then Allison Rivers, Morgan, and her husband, John. Uh, Jenny Hudson, who's in Birmingham. Christine Ulansky, and Mary and Jane Westfall, who are on the west, well, west coast and the central of the, uh, center of the co uh, country. You can't tell that I'm nervous, can you? <laughs> anyway, um, the, there's one person also who's not here, is just not able to be here. And this is a person who wrote the poem that my daughter is going to read, my stepdaughter. And um, he's, his name is Dr. Marty Goldenberg, and some of you NIHers know him. Somehow, when Saul retired 25 years ago, his daughter, Laura Rosen, somehow found the time to contact how many? I don't know. There are a lot of people. She put together a fest shrift and asked everyone, please, to uh, contribute. And so the poem that she's going to read is by Dr. Marty Goldenberg. And hello, Marty. I'm sorry you're not going to be here. OK. Hopefully you have this to read along in case uh, I go too fast, which is a, a family characteristic, to speak too fast, <laughs> um, or am not clear. OK, Saul by Martin Goldenberg. Gather round children, come one, come all, and hear the story of a Rosen named Saul. A native son of the old Bay State, Saul entered this world in July 28. As a child, surely nobody's fool, he spent his youth at Boston's Latin School. A Harvard education was his idea of heaven, and he earned his bachelor's in 47. Saul thought that a scientist's life was his fate. He studied at Northwestern, earned a doctorate. Yet he wasn't finished his schooling, you see, so it was back to Boston for a Harvard MD. Then off to San Francisco, a town quite wild. But he didn't go to be a flower child. As a resident on university hospital wards, he qualified for the internal medicine boards. Saul came to Bethesda halfway through this training to spend two years with no hint of complaining. Folks said of him, his endeavors never cease in the Institute of Metabolism and Digestive Disease. <laughs> One more year in the city by the bay, then Saul came back to Bethesda to stay. He's worked here brilliantly for 33 years, earning co-workers plaudits and cheers. The first 23 years that he was back, he demonstrated his endocrinological knack. He thought it terribly, terribly grand to unravel a problem of the thyroid gland, or to diagnose with his physician's prism hyperaldosteronism. And he most certainly earned the award of the Endocrinology Specialty Board. On clinical work, he seemed to thrive. But he took a year in 75 to sample a bit of the research story in a Mill Hill, London laboratory. Back to Bethesda in 76, Saul continued his clinical research mix. But he thought in 1984, that there was a job he'd like to do more. So came he then to the clinical center as deputy director and problem preventer. He did all the assignments the best that he could while not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. <laughs> he worked on budgets, he chaired grand rounds, his enthusiasm knew no bounds. And he did well when he took the reins following John Decker's cardiac pains. He spent nine months as acting head doing a bang up job, they said. His work was thought to be so glorious that the Corps gave him a medal meritorious. Back as deputy, Saul continued to serve with his usual eagerness and verve. But one of the things he showed best, you'll agree, was his skill in lexicography. Saul loves science, but he loves words too, and he uses them as mere mortals can't do. In any situation, you can trust this man to use le bon mot juste. And perfect documents are to his credit, because you know our Saul just loves to edit. You write a memo that's right in the groove, and he'll find a number of points to improve. In 1990, when John D. left for good, Building One did what they should. They asked Saul to be in charge again, and he's been acting boss since then. 
His leadership has been inspired, but after all these years, he's tired. He plans to relax and enjoy the breezes while listening to Verdi and on his CDs. <laughs> Saul, we're sad to see you leave, but we know you don't want us to grieve. We won't, but know till hell has frozen that we think the world of you, Saul Rosen. Thank you. Saul and I met, uh, have a seat please. <laughs> Saul and I met in a class, a Smithsonian course called Vocal Virtuosi. And boy do we have two vocal virtuosi today. And not only that, but we have a pianist who is a virtuosa, and I'm going to introduce them. Um, Betty Bullock is the maestra at the piano, and if you want to come over. Um, Schleta Hilton is our soprano diva, and I have known her reputation, but only recently got to hear her sing, and you'll be wowed by that. Last, last but not least is <laughs> bass baritone Jean Galvin. He and I have performed together several times, but what's really interesting is that when Saul retired, he decided that he wanted to learn a few things about singing. And so I had just worked with Gene, and I said, well, do, would you like, maybe, maybe he'll teach you. So Saul studied with Gene for a year and found his voice. So now I bring you, I hope you all, I'll, I'll go check and see if everybody has programs. Does everybody have a program? I think so. so it's, I'm turning off the mic. <laughs>
Unlike Saul, I'm not a doctor, but I play one in Don Pasquale. <laughs> and since Saul loved puns, it seems uh, appropriate this Dr. Malatesta means sick head or evil head. <laughs> to the moon, you can see the earth and see the man that she loves, the prince, and she sang, please tell him that I'm here and I'm waiting. Thank you. 
character I do play in real life, a voice teacher. <laughs> Oh, 
tempestades os guarda.
run into me, huh? <laughs> Guess who she just ran into? <laughs> The, uh, the plot things I told you about in the beginning, we know that by the end of the first aria by the other base. And it gets crazier and crazier as it goes. <laughs> but basically, at this uh, previously on Pro with Rode, we have, uh, <laughs> I have imprisoned her boyfriend, my rival, and she's trying to figure a way to bargain for his life. <laughs> what does she have to offer? Ask Tosca, right? Let's say yes. So, and uh, but she has a little trick up her sleeve. You want to tell them? Well, she she bargains herself in exchange for Monrico, but she's really saying, "But I'll kill myself before he can touch me." Now, the music just kind of says it all. Yeah. <laughs> so. <Right. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
couldn't get through a voice lesson with Saul without at least, I don't know, a hundred puns. Uh, well, we were both incorrigible about that, and so we encouraged each other as much as we could. And so, what better way to enjoy a good pun than a show that mixes Shakespeare and Cole Porter and Embarrassment of Riches, huh? This is from Kiss Me Kate.
guess it's safe to turn the mic on again. Um, I'm, let's see. Well, we have about five minutes before the bar and the buffet will open. And I'm sorry that I've missed some of you when you came in. Uh, I, anybody I haven't said hello to, we have plenty of time to do that. And um, I'm, I would like to ask if there's one or two, three, four people who want to uh, relate an anecdote, one of those humorous things that might have happened to you with Saul Rosen. Um, I will do one that's very brief, and then I think a couple of my family members might, and then if you want to, you may come up to the podium because I think it's easier for the videographer, but otherwise, you are welcome to, to talk to him. Uh, he will record you during the buffet, but I'm just going to talk about a very brief thing that happened. Uh, Saul, I said we met in a Smithsonian class and our first date was the last day of the class. He came up and sat on my row. And anyway, we went for pizza and, and beer. And that, that was fine. And he drove me all the way back from, from Bethesda to where I was living in Adams Morgan. So that, I, that was pretty impressive. The second date was, was fine, but it was Eugene O'Neill's Long day's journey into night. <laughs> so, that, you know, it was good, but it was long. And our third date was the first dinner date. So um, we went to a very nice restaurant, not far from here, actually, sort of old fashioned. But, um, so, and we did order different things, which was nice. And so when the entree came, Saul looked over at mine and he said, would I have a biopsy of that? <laughs> and from then on, you know, I knew this was going to be interesting. So I think... <laughs> <Yes. clears throat> um, I just have a quick one. I would like to correct the record here. I think this was a lovely poem that Dr. Goldenberg wrote. Um, however, he, I think just for the, the sake of, of poetry, wrote that um, Saul thought it terribly, terribly grand to unravel a problem of the thyroid gland. But actually, uh, he was very proud of the fact that as an endocrinologist, he did nothing with the thyroid. Because that, that was just so obvious. Um, and he actually uh, studied the gonadotropins produced by the ovaries and testes. Um, so he, he was fond of saying that he got to think about sex all day and get paid for it. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I want to thank you so much for coming and to the performers. That was just wonderful, magical, inspired. And the man that we're here celebrating would have loved it. Um, my dad had a lot of quirks. <laughs> he quacked like a duck for children. And never once did it strike him that as a doctor, walking around <laughs> quacking could have seemed like something not to do. No, rather, putting a smile on a child's face was just deeply important to him, and he recognized the real value and worth in doing that. And he also carried three by five cards around and read pens and wrote things down. And guy had a pretty good memory for most of his life, but he just knew that writing it down guaranteed he'd remember it, and he didn't ever care how it looked. And I'm just so glad to have been somebody who was taught those kinds of lessons. Dad didn't find it strange to say to somebody that he admired and thought highly of, you know, we should clone you. <laughs> and he never said it about somebody's appearance. It was always about who they were inside, their essence. And in the times we're living in right now, to lose a person of real integrity, loyalty, honesty, and decency is a great loss. And so I have to just throw my dad's words right back at him, pop. We should have cloned you. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is completely spontaneous, but I'm so inspired. I grew up next door to the Rosen family in Bethesda, and um, Dr. Rosen's children were my best, best playmates growing up. 
And Dr. Rosen was sort of an eminence grease in our neighborhood, I must say. He, he was always very tall, and um, he had these, these black rimmed glasses. He always looked quite serious, but we knew, once we spent time with him, that he always you know, had a very humorous, funny side. And that came with the puns. And I used to always play in their house and hear him making puns all, and he'd sort of wait for you to react. And you had to react or else, you know, you just didn't merit, you know, much attention from him. So one time we, we had a great neighborhood. We all played out in this, we lived in this cul-de-sac. We played out in the, in the cul-de-sac, a great number of kids. It was a really one of those old fashioned neighborhoods. And we were, like kids do, we were collecting acorns to have an acorn fight. And, um, so we were setting up teams and everything, and it must have been a weekend because Dr. Rosen was home and he must have looked out that big kitchen window and was like, what are they doing out there? And we were like, you know, uh, husbanding our, our acorns, we were starting to throw them at each other, and he was not gonna have anything like that. And he came out and he gathered us all together, and whenever he wanted to um, sort of express his disapproval, it was always in a very, you know, equanimous, he was never very critical, but he was like, kids, you just can't do this. And he always spoke to you like you were an adult, and even when you were a child. And, and he said, you just can't do this. It, it's not safe, and somebody's gonna get hurt. And, you know, just throwing acorns is just nuts. And I looked at him. <laughs> I looked at him, I'm like, <sighs> and he didn't get it. He didn't even hear his own pun. <laughs> and, and I was like, and after that, I had his respect because I caught him on a pun that he didn't even recognize he had made. And from then on, I just sort of, when I walked past him, I just sort of had this sort of, I was a little bit taller in my shoes because I caught him at a pun that he didn't even realize he had made. So anyway, I'm, I'm, I love Dr. Rosen. <laughs> Please make yourselves comfortable and, and enjoy, and I will be sure to see everyone. Thank you. I wanted to add a couple more anecdotes to my previous one. I grew up right next door to the Rosens and was involved in their lives quite a bit. And one year they all went away to England and in their place came four beautiful young ladies who worked at the British Embassy. And these beautiful young ladies all had many admirers. And every weekend there was a wild party at their house with all kinds of fancy sports cars out front when the, when the whole neighborhood was aware of it. And we just thought it was the greatest thing because suddenly there was so much action at the Rosen house. And I think the whole time Dr. Rosen had no idea what was going on in his house, but it was, it was fun for that year. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
And then the other one I have is actually on a more serious note. My father was very ill for quite a long time and had an undiagnosed situation with a lot, causing him a lot of headaches and pain. And he'd seen many, many experts and um, they had no idea what was wrong with him. They tried lots of different therapies and nothing seemed to be working and it got worse and worse. And one weekend he came to pick us up. My parents were divorced and he was waiting out in front of our house, waiting for us to gather our swimsuits or whatever. And... Dr. Rosen came out and just started chatting with my father. And my father described what was going on with him. And Saul thought for a little bit and said, you know, I think I know exactly what you have. I think what you have is what I wrote my dissertation on. I think you have a hemangioblastoma. And my father just looked at him in shock. And sure enough, that's what my father had. And thanks to Saul, my father re had surgery and recovered and is still alive today. Wow. Great story. So we owe we owe our deepest thanks to Saul for diagnosing my father out in the cul-de-sac early on a Saturday morning. Here, here, <laughs> nice. Hi, Debbie, and everybody watching this. I'm Matt Gorman, a friend of Craig's. Um, we uh, I've known Craig since I was 15, and I'm now 58. <laughs> 58. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I just want to say Saul was an awesome guy, and when you're young and you're you know, coming into adulthood, you're 15, 16, and, you know, didn't quite get along with my own father, who was a little tough and didn't understand me. Saul was very mellow and understood me and allowed me to express myself and be foolish and <clears throat> let me state what I thought was the correct thing and then would engage me and, you know, help me learn and, and you know, d didn't shame me. You know, a lot of adults at, at that time, when they're trying to teach you, they shame you and tell you the correct answer. Saul never did that. Saul, you know, guided you and, and, and he was just very kind and um, very accepting and allowed Craig and me and the friends to be down in the basement and, you know, crank Peter Gabriel and Genesis and all the great music, yes. <laughs> and uh, anyway, just, just Saul was a great guy and Debbie, I'm really glad to have met you. I, I know you and he had a wonderful relationship and I was very happy for him that he found someone like you and that was that was wonderful as well and I know that his uh, kids appreciated all that you did for Saul especially as he got ill so anyway love you love Saul love the Rosens love Laura love life cheers I just wanted to say that Saul Rosen was the first person to take me to see any Broadway musical play uh, movies and he opened my eyes to Hello Dolly, to Oliver, to I'm trying Mary Poppins. So this is how it would go. I'd be playing over at their house and Laura and I would be in her room like playing with our guinea pigs or whatever. And then he'd come to the door and he'd poke his head in the door and he'd go, LB, can I have a word with you? He called her LB and I was LG because we were all Laura's on our street and there was LC and LD anyway. So, LB, can I have a word with you? So she'd look up and she'd go out the door and then she'd come back in and she'd say, you want to go see a movie? You want to go see Mary Poppins? And I'd say, me? Go with you? Yeah, my dad wants to take us to the movies. Oh my God, we never did that in my family. That was amazing. Of course I wanted to go see a movie. So he took me and Laura and I don't even remember who else because I was just so thrilled to see lots of Broadway musical movies. Um, when we were young and I loved it and I, I I did the same thing for my kids of course they're all on TV but I made sure that they all sat down and watched hello Barbara Streisand and hello Dolly or or the South Pacific whatever all those movies and my my kids grew up loving them as much as I did so thank you to Saul for doing that for me Hi, I'm here with my son Liam here he just turned five and he remembers pop up is the guy who always he quacked at him and he read him stories. He, one of his first books was his, remember the ABC, the alphabet book? And he would read that to you, remember? And you just listen intently. <laughs> and anyway, he was the kind of guy, he, he was always very warm. Yeah. Oh, oh, don't cover my eyes, I can't see. But Pop Pop loved you very much. Remember how much he used to love you? Remember that? Yeah. He does. <laughs> Anyway, he was the kind of person who was always very warm. He, he didn't care who you were, if you were a complete stranger. He'd come right up to you and make you feel like you're welcome, like, like you want, almost like if you're one of his friends. 
He truly cared about people, and that really impressed me. He had the kind of personality that could just okay. just make you believe in him. And when I was young and I was growing up, he had so many quotes and, um, and jokes, and he'd always apply them to any situation. Thank you very much. And he'd say things like, um, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Video. Like whenever I, had, I got a B instead of Video. a B, he'd say, well, the B is good enough for now. We can keep on working from then. Video. So do you have anything to say to Pop Pop? Bye, Pop Pop. Good, Pop Pop. Yeah, we love you, Pop Pop.